Okay, this is my attempt to explain the Grand Canyon. Now, the first thing that you need to know is the North Rim, which is where I am now. It's about over a thousand feet higher than the South Rim. Uh, instantly, of course, due to uh, Venom's argument that it's all flat. Now, there is continuity between the sedimentary layers on either side, but because of the uplift that actually happened about 70 million years ago, that's the uplift that caused the uh, Rockies. And of course, once you form the Rockies, you then form the Colorado River, and that carved the canyon over the last six million years. Now, the first thing you notice about the canyon, of course, is it doesn't look like a drainage channel. Drainage tunnels tend to be relatively straight and relatively U-shaped because they take fast running water for a relatively short period of time. This, with meandering courses like this, the Grand Canyon looks like it was carved very slowly and it goes all the way down to these dark areas here. Now, now comes the second bit is what's the origin of all these layers? Well, let's start with the dark stuff. That's the oldest stuff in the canyon. It's about two million years, two billion years old, sorry, and it's the Vishnu schists. Now, not a lot is known about the Earth um, two billion years ago, uh, or well, yeah, where the continents are were and, and such like, but this Vishnu basement rock is basically sedimentary rock that's being cooked in. Um, uh, a volcano, no, not volcano, cooked by the Earth's internal heat. Okay, the next layer that we come to is the Bright Eyes Shale. Uh, so, sorry, uh, the, the yeah, the Bright Eyes Shale, which is here, and this is just post -Cam the Cambrian explosion, so it's littered with fossils of trilobites and such like. And this is the Bright Eyes Shale, um, and then. There is a period, so this is now a, the, the, the correlated history of Earth. So back in the Cambrian, a uh, large portion of North America was actually under water. And that's when you get your trilobites and the such like. Right? And then the... Yeah. Then there is a dry spell in America, and the big deposition of the of the Grand Canyon uh, comes in this region here where North America is still under water or, or this part of North America is still under water and so that's that, that that's this region here of the Grand Canyon and then later after that, um, America rises above sea level, and the Appala uh, not the, yeah, the, uh, the Appalachian Mountains rise here. And this whole region on the backside of America becomes a vast desert, and that gives you the huge sand dunes, which is actually part of Zion. So this is the um, Vishnu uh, chest. Then you've got the bright, um, the bright angel uh, shale here. Then all these layers up here. We're now back into uh, this region here, about 200 million years ago, which is when you get these huge sand dunes that are actually mostly about 50% of them is composed of stuff that has come from the Appalachian Mountains. And then much later, um, this is really very recent, there is a, another inundation where you get this Cretaceous Seaway and that gives you the rocks of Bryce and the such like. And then finally, from here we go up to about 70 million years ago, which is where we get the uplift of the Rockies. And the uplift of the Rockies um, also uplifts this entire plateau. And But because the Rockies have been uplifted, there is now all the precipitation and snow on the, that falls on the Rockies, and all that water melts and carves the canyon. Um, over the last, about the last six million years. So that is the story of the Grand Canyon. 
Okay, one last thing on dating sedimentary rocks, because uh, it's a bit of a trick. Now, the one thing that you can do is if you find microcrystals in um, the sedimentary rock, you can actually date the origin, the age of the origin of those rocks. So that gives you a, a feel for the age of the sedimentary rocks. However, the best, by far the best way to do it is to actually find a lava flow, ideally in the middle of the sedimentary layer, which you can then date by the potassium argon or by one of the transuranic radioisotope datings. And that gets you an absolute age on a sedimentary layer. And you can tie that with lava flows, um, other lava flows in the same layer, or a such like. So this actually gives you a way of correlating all the layers around the, the, the Earth um, on an absolute scale. And then you get other like markers like the KT boundary, you know, that's where the, this meteor crashed in. You get a layer of high iridium. So that's another way of sort of indexing all the sedimentary rocks together. The second thing that you can do is this, this is the absolute way of dating um, sedimentary rocks is if you have sedimentary rocks but no lava, how do you date them? Well, then you, if, if all else fails, you look for fossils in the sedimentary rock, uh, ideally rare kinds of fossils. So trilobites would be a terrible example because they live for like, oh, uh, whatever it was, 200 million years. Yeah. So you look for, if you can find a relatively rare fossil in this layer, and then on another continent you can find the same fossil, you can actually correlate these two layers together. Because these layers all have specific origins, like, you know, some of these are from um, erosions of specific mountain ranges, so they are different on different continents. But you can actually tie them together in absolute age, firstly by lava flows. That's the ideal method. And that absolutely dates them. But if that fails, you can then actually, if you can find rare fossils in them, then that actually allows you to correlate the age of sedimentary rocks on different continents. Anyway, so that's just a little bit on dating sandstone, not sandstone, sedimentary rocks. Just one of those unexpected moments of, of beauty. So I've just come out from some huge thunderstorm that was over the Grand Canyon, and I get the the clouds, the storm clouds, uplit by the fiery sunset, and ahead of me the blue sky, still with the odd thunderhead, basked in the in the glow of the sun, the sunset. Things like this that really do make travelling interesting. Completely unexpected. Yeah, I've just been battling through the dark roads, and now, now you get this. Amazing. <laughs>